Hi, everyone. I'm um, really excited to be here with you today. I'm here with Pat and Steve Levitt, and we would like to share our story about a friend of ours in Uganda and our interactions with him and the miracles that have just transpired over the past year. Um, so um, Pat and Steve thought I should start by telling maybe about how I met Steve, uh, Michael. So I will tell a little bit about him and about the kids and, and, uh, and then Pat and Steve are gonna jump in and tell us some, some things as well. So in February of 2021, I met um, someone online. Um, his name was Michael. He had reached out to me through my music page at Sarah Lynn Barrel Music Facebook page. And he had um, asked me how he could get a copy of the Book of Mormon. And I immediately responded and I was able to send the missionaries to his village. He had already had the missionaries to his village before and had a good friend named Tom that got baptized um, a few months later after our interaction. So they were all kind of learning together. Um, I uh, sent him some screenshots of the Book of Mormon before he actually got his own copy. And over the past couple of years, we had developed a good friendship and I was answering a lot of his questions and um, it was filling a need for me as well as um, it was COVID and it just was a very bright light in my life during that time. So um, he loved my music and I sent him some songs and we talked a lot about the gospel. And um, in uh, the spring of 2023, this past year, I felt inspired to do a little bit more. In fact, probably even a few months before that, the spirit was working on me to do something more for Michael. He had told me a little bit about the village and his orphanage that he runs there. So he's got 45 kids that he takes care of in this village or in this orphanage. They all have come to him by various circumstances and him and his wife take care of these kids and help to school with them with many volunteers. And, um, and they live in a village of about 600 people. So it's small. Um, so anyways, I thought, well, maybe I could use my music for some of this. And I had the thought that I could maybe move about 900 songbooks and sell these very quickly and then send the money down there. But I had some questions about how that would affect taxes and, and I'm not really a charity organization and I had lots of questions. So one day on March the 7th, I decided I would call down to Salt Lake at the church at the philanthropy department and just ask some questions and see how, um, what they thought I could do with my songbooks and maybe I could partner. I wasn't really sure how to, to go about this. And I ended up on the phone with a man who was actually from Uganda. Um, it, it was a, a couple of, of, they passed the phone to a couple of people and I ended up on, this phone, on the phone with this man who had a missionary companion who still lived in Uganda, who um, did family history audits in Rwanda, Ethiopia and Uganda. And he said, well, let's get him on the phone and see if maybe he can go and visit the village and find out some more information. So on March the 10th, I believe it was, this man made the journey to this little village and um, took some video and photos and talked with different people and um, verified that everything that Michael had been telling me was true and that there was definitely some very important needs that needed to be taken care of and that we could maybe help with. And so at this point, it was now Saturday, I believe the 11th, of March and all of that had transpired in a week. And um, I went and talked to my dad and I was like, dad, I don't know what to do. I hadn't really told him about what I was up to, but he said, did you know that Pat and Steve Levitt go to Uganda? And they're actually probably, I think planning a trip right away here. You should call them. So Pat and Steve, what day did I call you? This was, I think the 13th. Yeah, Something right along there. that line. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the 13th. So that was Monday the 13th. I called them and said, I have this friend in Uganda. I've sent somebody there and verified that everything that he was telling me was indeed factual and that there are great needs. And, and um, you guys should pick up the story here and tell me a little bit about what happened and how we both got involved. Okay, I'll start. <clears throat> the reason we're going to Uganda is we had been there 15 years earlier on a rotary um, trip because uh, one of our Rotary members, Drew Cahoon, had uh, got the money and he had refurbished a dental facility. And so we went there and we met a young man who we decided to sponsor through his schooling. 
and he was going to be graduated as a medical student soon. His name was uh, Mikasa John. And also we were on our way to Cape Town, South Africa for an award for one of our district uh, Rotary members. So we had this trip planned, we had our trip booked, and we only had three days, I believe, in Uganda on our way to South Africa. And so when uh, Sarah called us, we said, oh, that'd be great. But then we looked at the map and this young man we wanted to see, Mikasa John, lived west of Kampala about three hours. And the orphanage was about five hours east. But we thought about it. We thought, sure, let's do it. And uh, we were able to locate a good driver. Maybe, Pat, you can tell how we got the driver. Well, one of the things that happened was that we were going to a conference for Rotary here, well, in Calgary. Um, and someone said, well, so-and-so knows a good driver. And so he happened to be there. So I went up to him and I asked him if he knew a certain um, driver in Uganda who we could use for our, the purposes that we had. And I listed those purposes. And he said, oh, I've got the perfect driver for you. His name is Jonathan. And so we went ahead and contacted him. <laughs> Excuse me. And of course, Jonathan was very, very willing to help us. But, but it not only went from very, being very willing to help us, but it also was um, very, very awesome that it ended up where he actually would receive the money and buy the supplies that we were able to um, send him the funds for. And uh, because we didn't know how we were going to get it all together once we got there. Um, the funds that were raised by Sarah uh, and her Facebook page actually were given to Steve and Steve actually sent them to John. And that was a, a concern because mm -hmm. we thought we could just take the money and leave, but mm -hmm. He didn't. He was honest. He was so good with us. He gave us a list of everything he purchased and every cent was accounted for and it was made available in products so that the, the orphanage could receive blankets. They could receive mats and food and medical attention and um, all those different things that they needed at the time. And so we were so, so pleased because when we got at, got to um, the, the airport, he was there and his van was packed to the mm. hilt. There was just enough room for the three of us. We yeah. also had a granddaughter who came with us and she was so excited. So Pat, and, tell us about your granddaughter and what her desires were just a few days before we connected. And I, you had learned about the work I was doing there and I learned that you guys were going. Okay. Um, before she, she contacted us, we had asked just, we had just thrown the idea of we're going to Uganda, which anybody like to go. This is something that we kind of threw out to the whole family. And she was the only one that, that responded. She says, I would love to go. And so she uh, said, but you know what? I really want to go to an orphanage. And we thought, oh, an orphanage because we hadn't contacted, been in contact with Sarah yet. And um, so we talked to John Mikasa and John couldn't find an orphanage in his part of the area, part of, of uh, Kampala. And so uh, we thought, oh, something's got to happen, something, somewhere. And then magically, Sarah got in contact with us and she provided us for that opportunity. And our granddaughter, who was 16 at the time, she was loved by those children. She, the love that she had for those children was shown that as soon as she stepped out of the car. The smile that she had, and it was like they just were drawn to her. It was so exciting because it was such a wonderful experience for her because she was able to do and and share the candy that she had brought and the shoes and the all the many, many uh, different items. So it was a good, really good opportunity. So when we were preparing for all of this, like you guys contacted, or I talked, contacted you on the Monday, the 13th, on the Tuesday, you called us and said that you wanted to change um, your trip and be able to make a visit to this village. It would only be for maybe a day, but we could bring some supplies. So that's when I started getting really busy online 
And um, you, you would ask me to see if I could raise some, some money to, to be able to purchase supplies and that you had several large suitcases that could be filled. And so I contacted Michael and said, um, what, what is needed? Because I didn't want to just send whatever that we thought was needed. We wanted to actually find out exactly what was needed. So he sent me a list of school supplies, medical supplies, shoes, socks, underwear, other clothing, food items. And then at the very end of the list, he said, and if it be possible, could there be a wheelchair for a little girl mm -hmm. who was disabled named Joyce? And so I was on the hunt for for well we we decided to buy a few supplies here but um out of the six thousand dollars we raised in 10 days it was it, that's a miracle in and of itself that so many people came forth and with very little information wanted to help and um so we were able to raise this money and fill suitcases my daughter and i went to the dollar store and and purchased lots of toys we decided that we would do um, some gift bags for the children because we didn't know what they'd even ever received anything like this. We wanted Christmas to come to their village in March. And uh, so I purchased on Amazon a bunch of drawstring bags and um, we were able to put socks and underwear in every bag and um, a toy and a little treat. And um, at the very last minute, I thought, you know, wouldn't it be awesome if we could do some sort of pen pal program and have these kids writing kids from our hometown and so um i put it out there that we could connect and i anyways i we got good response on that and we've got kids now writing the kids and and there's we were able to raise more money for the postage for an entire year of letters to go back and forth because they wouldn't be able to afford the postage to send to to canada so um that was another fun thing we did and um but at, back to the wheelchair we should talk about the wheelchair so I put it out online that I was looking for something, but I want to tell you my prayer. My prayer was very, very specific. And I asked Heavenly Father, if there could be a wheelchair that's just in someone's garage that, that isn't being used, and maybe somebody's mother passed away just a couple of years ago, and the family didn't know what to do with this wheelchair, but it, there it sat. And a few days later, I get a phone call from one of our school teachers, Sue, and Sue said, Sarah, I have your wheelchair. <laughs> and, and I couldn't believe it because it was one of the last things that we were trying to figure out. And, um, and she, she told me that her mother had passed away two years ago and that the wheelchair was just sitting in her garage and she and her sisters had talked and they had decided that that's what they wanted that wheelchair to, to have happen to this wheelchair was to go to Uganda. So I was like, Sue, I'll be right there. I got off the phone and I ran over to her house. I I didn't even change my clothes from the wedding I'd been serving at. <laughs> I ran over <laughs> my, heel, my heels and dress too and said, I've had, I have to see this. Well, I couldn't believe how perfect it was. It had like some little extra bells and whistles on this wheelchair that would help for someone who is disabled. It had leg supports and a head support. It wasn't your regular transport chair. The only, and it was very tiny as well because her mother was a very tiny lady. And I just was like, okay, well, this is great, but it doesn't fold up. And I was wondering how in the world are we going to get this thing to Uganda? And so I call up, well, I was actually on, a meet, on my way to a meeting at your house. And, uh, and so, and just as I was coming up the steps, Sue calls and, or texts me and says, Sarah, I forgot to tell you, my mother's name was Joyce. Oh. <laughs> and I was just like, I laughed right out loud on the street. I was like, are you kidding me? Like this wheelchair just came out of nowhere. It was an a perfect answer to my prayer. And not only that, the owner of the wheelchair has the same name as the little girl in Uganda that it's going to. So I was just absolutely elated. I went up the stairs to your house and knocked on the door. And you, I remember you opened the door and you said, do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> we have miracles. And I said, I have miracles. And we, <laughs> came in and we, we ended up having a meeting at your kitchen table. And you told me about the Rotary Club member in Uganda that was going to help out and correlate some things. And be some boots on the ground there for us as well and mm -hmm. um and then i was able to tell you about this wheelchair and i remember pat you were so cute you you, you were like i don't care how this wheelchair gets to uganda it's getting to uganda and, you just, <laughs> <laughs> and we were trying to figure out how that would happen and if, would we dismantle it put it in a bag we couldn't figure it out and i said pat you just got to ride the wheelchair over to you <laughs> and then <laughs> that's exactly what happened <laughs> yeah. so i thought okay mm -hmm. i gotta swallow some pride and ride this 
wheelchair at the airport. And so as soon as we got out of the car, we, we put the wheelchair on the ground, I got in it, and I was in the wheelchair every step of the way until we were in Uganda. And I didn't realize how limited it is to, to be in a wheelchair. And I just really felt like she's this little girl, this Joyce, she's so much more limited than I was even riding the, uh, the wheelchair. But when we got the wheelchair to her place or her, to the orphanage, um, we kind of, we drove it in or rode it in, not even rode it in, but we took it into where she was. She was on a mat and um, she just kind of looked up at us and she really doesn't move. She didn't move anywhere during the day. She could kind of uh, army, um, army roll around, but that was about all she could do. And so what we did was I picked her up and I put her in it and we buckled her and we started moving her around. You shouldn't have, you should have seen her face. It was absolutely mm. unbelievable. She was just surprised. She was happy, but she was so surprised. And she, I don't think she's been that stimulated in a long, long time. Mm. To be able to go to the front of the whole uh, orphanage and to be, to sit at the head of the whole orphanage and receive gifts and to see the other kids and to be part of the program. And there wasn't an aid by her. We were all just there around yeah. her. And it was just, she even fell asleep. She was so overly stimulated. <laughs> she fell asleep during part of the ceremonies that were going on. And it was just so such a precious, precious time for her don't, to have received. Don't that. you feel like everything, uh, like as, as you guys got there and as you saw, like, for example, wasn't there just like barely enough shoes for not even just enough, but enough for even some of the other village children to take? Yeah. It was like, you it, there was all these kids that just came running to, to the yeah. Yeah. and and like when they were opened up and things were distributed. Um, right. Right. And, oh, and then like, let's talk about the, the story of um, the days for girls. Um, menstrual oh, care. right. Mm. Days yeah, for we girls. wanted to send some of those as well. And um, I called days for girls to find out, you know, what kind of timeline and they're just, they said they needed at least six months in advance to prepare these. So we thought, well, what are we going to do? That would be something that would be a very needed thing. And um, Pat, did you, did so, you make a phone call or what? I can't remember how that went. Uh, well, I, I was trying to find out how we could get to um, get some types of supplies to take for the days for girls. And someone in my sphere, they just said, well, why don't you talk to a certain lady in our community who goes goes to Africa? And so I gave her a call. And as soon as she answered the phone, I told her my purpose. And it was just a silence on the other end. She says, you know what I'm working on right now? She says, I'm working on just finishing up my 20th kit. And you can have them all. Mm -hmm. So 20 kits came with us to Uganda. And we were able to distribute those to 13 girls. Yeah. And it was amazing because they had there in their culture, they, uh, this is something that is very, very embarrassing for girls. And so when I had all these 13 girls, I had Michael translate for me. And I said to them, you know, this is nothing to be embarrassed about. I says, this is something where you can move around. And I showed them how they were going to move around <laughs> and they were laughing and, and it was just a, re a really good, uh, a good spirit about it because they were able to see that they now can uh, take care of that aspect of their life and not be embarrassed because yeah. of it. Yeah. It's so important. Um, I just remember as we were putting the suitcases together and of course your daughter um, was also putting together a couple of suitcases for your granddaughter to take. And, um, they they made I'm a child of God t-shirts for all mm -hmm. of the children. So they also received, I forgot the t-shirt. That was really important. And it made me think, I want to write another verse of I'm a child of God. I didn't <laughs> have anyone's permission, but I did write a little verse for these orphan children who at this point in their lives do not have parents kind and dear. Like it didn't go with the lyrics. And so Pat being one of our show choir directors in, in our <laughs> town, she she actually taught them the song and um it, it, it was just so special that these kids were able to have this much connection and love from us and we've developed a beautiful friendship. Steve, tell us about um, some of the 
crop stuff and that like I forget the title of what you did before you retired with um with with the research and all of that and well I I worked with farmers here locally to do agronomy to help them in their crop production okay and so when I was there they had two garden spots they had a small one that was about we walked to it, it was about two or three blocks away and there they were growing tomatoes and they were probably a foot tall and they looked really good and they also had another garden it was about uh, two acres but it's almost 45 minute drive for them to get to that so it's kind of hard to manage but anyway the the one little garden with tomatoes I really told them that uh, we would supply some fungicide because it's very humid there and so they're very attuned to diseases so after that, uh, they applied that, and within about a month and a half, they had a very productive uh, tomato harvest, and we talked about how to preserve it, and, you know, so they had uh, an abundance of tomatoes. And then at the other farm, they grew mainly corn, beans, and rice. And uh, again, I talked to them about fertilization, you know, that they maybe need some more nutrients. So again, we funded some fertilizer that they can put on the crop. And they had a very abundant corn crop. It was more than they normally get. And it's enough corn. They grind it up and they make this uh, meal. And then they make kosher, they call it. And it's enough for four months. So I told them if you immediately when you harvest, I mean, they've got weather that is uh, ideal for production year round to plant corn again. So I just got pictures probably a week or so ago and the corn is about chest high. And so hopefully by the time they run out of their corn, they'll have another harvest and just be able to sustain their orphanage. And then they had rice. Uh, they had enough rice for about two months. So they're becoming more self-reliant. And I think that's a real goal that we want to have is to help them become self-reliant in their food production. And so we're doing all we can from a distance to help them in that. And it's been a great thing to see it. And Michael's is very excited. And yeah. he's getting some of the older kids some of the workers to go up and help when they're weeding or harvesting and it's been great for them. You still sent me pictures of um, a young lady placing all the bean stalks for all of them. Okay. Um, yeah. They're also doing, I, we should mention that they also have some of the older children, they're teaching how to sew. And mm -hmm. one of the things that they do to, to provide income for the orphanage is they um, sell the, the, these different uniforms for um, other schools in the area. Um, other private schools and whatnot and other, even other orphanages so they're they're sewing and learning skills and um, Michael's always said that his biggest goal was to be able to provide a school not only for these orphan children but also to help other um, people that desire to learn and adults and in the community so that they can also provide for their families and um, have some resources and skills to to be able to do that. Um, Another thing they're doing just uh came to my mind is that you have a few computers and they're teaching the older kids um, computer skills. Yeah. And so that's a great thing that will help them in the future. So they're doing so so many practical things, you know, they're learning how to garden, they're learning how to sew, they're learning computer skills. So it's not only just regular education, but it's kind of life skills that they're learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, anyways, wonderful people. They're just, they're doing amazing things with these kids and I they're trying to make these kids lives better a little fun interesting tidbit is um his wife Beluka she had a baby in October and um she named the baby after my husband Mark <laughs> yeah. a whopping eight pound baby he's so so healthy and happy and they're doing so well um in August uh Michael was baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and I was able to witness his baptism by zoom at three it was three o'clock in the morning my time <laughs> And uh, was able to visit with him that right at that moment, and also um, the next day with my family. It was it was really fun to be able to congratulate him and visit with him and have my family be part of that. Um, trying to think of what else we should tell. It was just amazing, like from start to finish, from the minute we connected, it was just like miracle after miracle, right down to even how the suitcases weighed forty nine point five pounds and <laughs> were able to, under the fifty dollar limit. Like I think we just cheered when we we raised them up and could see that they were only fifty pounds or under fifty pounds. But um, yeah, it's, I it's can just make a couple other comments. Yeah, sure. Number one is the driver Jonathan was just amazing, as Pat said. But once we got there, he he was there the whole day and a half with us that we were there. And during the day, we needed other supplies, other food, and so on. We gave him a list, 
And away he went with the money. He got it all and brought it back to the orphanage. And he was just such an asset to help us. Mm -hmm. And there was also a lady named Asha who became connected with because of another Rotary member in Calgary that has a foundation. They do a lot of work with hospitals. And Asha is there. She lives in Campella, but she goes to this village area quite regular. And she was there. And she uh, made connections um, with a Rotary Club that we were able to visit. And John, or pardon me, Michael has been able to visit the Rotary Club a number of times. And so Rotary has been a good support through the people and through the club there. And they've been there to assist where they can. You're super grateful for that partnership, aren't we? Yeah. I am grateful for that. And there's more happening. Um, so the next thing that's on the horizon is um, there is a need for a home for these children to actually, they're sleeping at the school right now and kind of some of them been farmed out to different places in the community. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Pat, you guys were the ones there um, saw that what was happening, but um, William said that that was one of the needs is they just didn't really have proper accommodation. So, oh, and I forgot to mention William, the fellow that I sent there initially um, to, to kind of over, like see what was going on there and be some boots on the ground. He actually went back with Pat and Steve um yeah. he says do you think I could ride with them I said well you might have to ride on the roof <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was so full of supplies but um we've also hired a nurse there so that's something that I'm I'm doing um sorry we went out of time on this zoom call we're going to start it over and splice the call but anyways we've got a few minutes um uh, so yeah William went back and he's been an ongoing good friend to Michael and it's been so wonderful like they, one of the pictures they sent me was he says um William took me to Elders Quorum today. And <laughs> yeah. They went to church, and and Michael actually wrote me a few weeks ago and says, "I want to take all the orphanage children to church." I said, "All oh, forty-five." Yeah. He says, "Yes, we're just <laughs> trying to figure out transportation." And uh, so he's there's been other wonderful missionary opportunities that are happening there as well, which has um, been very exciting for me. Um, how he found out about my music was really there was a missionary that was serving there that had signed his guest book hashtag light the world and mm -hmm. uh, because I've written a song called light the world um, it popped up on his search and that's mm -hmm. how he found my music and so um, I, I send them music and we have this ongoing friendship with that and I share some of the stories with them behind the songs and whatnot but um, I wanted to say that my whole idea at the very beginning was to use songbooks to move um, to move these songbooks they're they're just sitting in storage I am not publishing any new songbooks and I would love to um, have them sold. And so I can actually use the money for a purpose that would be important, like helping Michael at the village. So um, I, it hasn't, it hasn't been something I've forgotten about, but all of this kind of came together with Pat and Steve. And I thought, well, I could still use these songbooks and maybe what we can do is now use these to, um, to raise money again for the purchase of a home for these children. There's something that just came on the horizon for them. There's somebody selling a home in the village. Um, there's a time limit on this. I think it had to be figured out by, like they had to sell by December, end of December, I think it was. Um, and so I thought, well, if we hop on this quick, maybe I can, we can raise more donations, either donations and or sell songbooks or a combination of both. I'm quite happy to have these things gone and um i couldn't bear to throw them in the dumpster that's what i keep saying to my husband it's like throwing my testimony in the garbage <laughs> so <laughs> i would love for it to be shared to um and then take every penny that would i would make and donate it to this this cause so that's my goal this is my light the world project this christmas is that i'm going to move these things and um clear out some storage space <laughs> in the process and hopefully we can get these kids a home so i believe this home was do you remember him telling you the square footage? I think it was around, I don't know, 1,500 or 2,000 square feet. Something like that. And it's got a pretty good sized yard. Yeah. Um, yeah, because where they're sleeping now, it's very congested. And then some have to sleep in another home that's pretty close to the orphanage. And mm -hmm. the facilities there, it's kind of open air, a lot of the classrooms. And this would be ideal to help these kids to be in a good environment. And it would be great. So I asked Michael, I said, well, who's going to be with the children if you guys get this home? Who's going to like, you know, kids get up in the night, kids, kids mm -hmm. need help, they need to be put to bed, you know? I was like, well, who's going to go with them? And he says, I've convinced Beluka that we are moving in with them. Oh. So, and then also their friend, Tom, that 
um, was baptized in 2021 um, and introduced Michael to the church. He's going to move in with them as well. Um, so, so they'll, and I'm sure other volunteers will come in and out and they'll be having help. So it's a lot of children to be under one roof, but, hmm. but I, I know that everything Michael does is with faith and prayers. He always says, God will provide or God will help us. I know this will be possible. This man has such incredible faith. And so, and, and faith with works can do miracles. So as I just want to keep helping him and doing things that will help bring sustainability, but also to show him the love of, of others and the love of God for that little village. And um, I'm just so grateful for you and you and Pat, you and Steve, like you guys have like just at the, being at the right place at the right time and been so willing because way I know that was a little bit of a, a reroute in your trip and it wasn't exactly what you had planned, but man, the experiences and miracles have been so wonderful from this. And we think too, that uh, sometimes the Lord just uses us and if we're willing, then things work out. Yeah. And that's where I think we were willing. And even though it was a little bit of a, a different type of a jog, yeah, look at the wonderful things that have happened. All yeah. wonder. It's all worth it. I've just thought to myself, you know, if if everyone in the world's doing little things like this, no one sleeps slips through the cracks. It's made me think more about ministering and our prophets called to minister to one another and how if we're all doing those things, um, everyone's lives are touched and we're blessed in the process, which yeah. gives us these the joy that we need in our trials. Because, you know, I really think sometimes well, like I said, at the very beginning, when I met Michael, it was during COVID. I had pretty much quit so on social media. I just, it was mind boggling how much contention was on there. And mm. I, for a while, I actually unfollowed everyone except for Michael and the, and oh. the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just, You weren't supposed to I just block him. <laughs> no, I just needed some clarity. And, and honestly, he was such a light in my life. I looked forward to every message and where I could share with him my testimony and it, it really brought a lot of joy into my life. So I really think that we're meant to, to interact and connect and serve one another. And it's a blessing for everyone on mm -hmm. both ends. So. Yes. Well, it's been a wonderful journey for us too. It's yeah. And it's not over. This is just the beginning. No, it's not. <laughs> this is just you got to get uh, some more people to go back to Uganda. So get ready, Sarah. I, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working <laughs> on it to go. We've we're in the middle of some transitions ourselves. And yeah. I said, like, well, we're in the waiting process of some things. Maybe we should just get on a plane and go and go yeah. <laughs> build some things. I don't know. My husband's kind of handy. Maybe, maybe we can do some good at, right in person. I know that they are so anxious to welcome us to their village. So yeah, I'm sure also. they are. It would be yeah. amazing to go. I even told my son who's, who's 15. I said, you should just bag school. He's like, mom, I can't do that. I'm like, oh, you could Yeah. <laughs> yes, for a month. And uh, yeah, it's high school. You can you learn it. so much. Oh, I know. Yeah. Uh, well, you guys are just wonderful. So I, I, I'm, I'm really grateful to our listeners who are watching this. Thank you for, uh, for hearing this out. And I'll, I'll leave a link down below where you can um, click and learn more about the, the donations we're raising for this home in Uganda. And hopefully we can get it done for Christmas and it will be the best Christmas ever for these kids. So, great. All right. Thanks, Thanks Sarah. Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. All the work you're doing. So many wait for the light of day Searching for truth Who will show them the way As those who heed the Savior's call Will show His love and bring light to
every wound and dries every tear. When we act in His name, it's as if He were here. In a world where the lonely seek to find one friend, in a world where there's heartache, we will help someone. Sami no manana, huh? Who can it? Uh huh?